this last year. This is my second year here at Biloxi. Um, this is my 14th year teaching. So um, I'm excited to see you guys. Thank you. I assumed most people wouldn't have an oboe, so I'm going to tell you some really good news and then some follow-up with really bad news. Really good news, it is not as difficult to start oboe players as you think it is. I promise. The pedagogy of what you know for flutes and clarinet and saxophone, a lot of that transfers to oboe, a lot of it. Really bad news, it is all about the reads. Really bad news. I'm sorry to break it to you. The read type, if the read's in tune, if the read is balanced, if the, all of that, that, that's really what's going to make or break your beginner double read players, bassoons as well. Yeah. So I'm going to give you some of my best advice on the way to bypass not knowing actually how to make oboe reads but perhaps how to fix oboe reeds so you can buy some good quality ones that are kind of in that midline for you and you can help make them as um, usable for your students as possible. I can give you a massive list of the reeds that I would recommend purchasing um, via Woodwind Brasswind or certain websites and I can, if you want to find me later, I won't go through all of that in this context, but it's all about the reeds. Yeah, that's, that's what's going to make it happen for you and your students. The second thing I'm going to say before I go into my read diatribe for you is most of us, myself included, when we're teaching in a middle school or junior high, most of us are working with usually hand-me-down instruments. We're working with the oboe that was 45 years of the high school, and now they've sent it to you at the middle school. Probably works, probably isn't broken, but it probably, for some strange reason, seems to break a lot after you get it, correct? It's broken like every year. I'm going to give you your fun tip on that. It's not the instrument, it's the case. What happens is they give you these instruments you've had for a while and the instrument goes to the shop, but the case is never updated. And when all of the lining and the padding and the wood frame that's inside of these cases goes away, that's what makes the instrument shift. Um, I've gone through four personal cases with my instrument. I've had it since probably 2000 and I've updated my case four times. Whenever any of this starts to become unglued or starts to wiggle in this case, the oboe or the bassoon's gonna wiggle, and that's why keys get bent, and that's why um, springs pop out, and that's why posts. So, if nothing else, I would recommend that you always really invest in a really good case for your double read instruments. Um, especially, often, those kids are kids that wanna practice, and they take their instruments home a lot, and they take them on and off buses, and they throw them on another floor, and they throw them on and off their bed. And all of that jostling is what creates a lot of the problems with the mechanics of the instrument. So older instruments can be fine, but I would highly recommend that you take a peek at the cases they're in and make sure that they're updated because that's going to really give you some good longevity with those older instruments. Cool. So reeds. First thing, double reeds always have to be soaked before they're played. There's this conversation a lot about soaking your reeds in warm water. Do not soak your reeds in warm water. It's the same reason why you don't want to soak the reed in your mouth. The warmth of the water or your mouth actually causes the reeds to open. And so then you're going to have to have a conversation about how to close the reed back, which you have to do with them anyways. But I would always recommend room temperature water. Cold water is going to make them close. Warm water is going to make them open. Yeah. So if you want to keep them pretty consistent to where they need to be, room temperature water. Yeah. Same reason why you don't want to soak them in your mouth, even though I have my entire life. <laughs> Nobody ever told me otherwise. Um, but the warmth will actually cause them to expand and they'll open. And then you have to have the whole conversation about getting them closed again, right? So warm temperature water is always best. Bassoon reeds have to be completely soaked before you use them, all the way through the string, all the way through the back side of the reed, because um, when the bassoon gets on the vocal, that actually should create a seal around the vocal. And if it's dry, it's not going to seal, and you're actually going to have layer, air leak out of the back side of the reed onto the vocal. You probably knew that, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Yep. So the same reason to be completely soaked before you put them on there. Usually, for both of them, five to ten minutes. Seems like a long time, but when you start class, put them in a cup, have them sitting there, have the instruments assembled, talk about some other things, put them in your mouth right before you have to play. Yeah? Um, I like to really early with my double read students um, create kind of an understanding of what a good read should look like and how it should work. Um, does anyone happen to have an oboe read with them you want to talk about? Okay, so there's a lot of like information about the actual build and you know development of the oboe read, but the first thing I want to always notice is I teach my kids to actually hold them up to the light before they play. First thing it's going to do is establish if there's any cracks going through them. It's hard to see if they're cracked because it kind of shadows the other blade and sometimes you can't tell very well if there's already a crack in it before they play. They will crack for no reason. 
I can't tell you why, but they will. Sometimes they'll just crack for absolutely no reason. So I like to hold them up right at the light, check both sides. You'll be able to kind of see through. This one actually has a crack on the left side of it, so we'll hope that it plays for me. Yeah, a lot of times, all of a sudden, the kids played really good the day before. They come in the next day, and they're really, really flat. And they weren't flat, same read next day. It's because they've developed a crack in the read, and they can't see it. Yeah, so knowing that there's a crack, and they can go ahead, this read isn't going to work, get rid of it. You can start on the next one. Um, the reads will change daily per the temperature or the weather. If it's raining, they will change. If it's really hot and it's really cold the day before, they will change. So one of the things I put in here, I really, really recommend, they need a large rotation of reads. A large rotation of reads. Yeah, I recommend five. There's a really good ProTech case on Amazon um, that's about $15. That's a five, a five case read or five read case. Let me say it the other way around. They really need a strong rotation of reads. And they need to be sort of a variety of reads. Like this one plays kind of soft. This one plays kind of sharp. This one plays maybe a teeny bit flat because they will, they will change, honestly, which is super frustrating. I know. I've never had a read I haven't had to adjust in my entire career, so they just do that all the time. But having a variety when weather or temperature changes um, helps them kind of stay ahead of it a little bit so they're not trying to fight the same read for a whole week when the temperature gets really hot and they're going to get adjusted. Yeah. So we want to always check, make sure it's not cracked. Um, they will play. The first thing that usually goes is the corners will start to break off the edges. Yeah, they will still play, but they'll get harder and harder to play as the edges start to deteriorate. That's a really good sign that they need to start getting new reads. The edges will be the first thing. The edges deteriorating are also the first thing that affects the high range of the instrument. That's sort of where the high notes come from. So if they've been playing, let's say, above the staff and it's been coming out pretty clearly, when those edges start to deteriorate, that's when the high end of the instrument's going to start to suffer. Yeah. So um, if you, again, hold it up to the light, you'll notice about a third of the way through, hopefully, there's a darker kind of oval-shaped section to the reed. Can you guys sort of see it? There's this little really light triangle that comes up this to the tip. Right underneath that triangle, there's kind of a dark oval. That's called the heart of the reed. Bassoons have it as well. That is where the pressure I hate to say the word pressure, but that is where the contact with the lips should be on the reed. It's closer to the tip than I think a lot of times we think. If you play way back into this section of the reed, they're going to have a lot of time, a lot of difficulty controlling the sound. It's going to be very squawky, if you will, very abrasive. It's going to be um, really loud, really out of control. So the best way to manage that is right on that thick, the thickest part of the reed, basically. Yeah? Um, so... Easy things to look at. If you have a reed and you hold it up, you see a crack, you don't see the heart of the reed, it's probably not a very good quality reed and it's probably not gonna make a very good sound. Like you should be able to very clearly identify the different sections of the reed when you look at it. Um, that's one of the really big differences between ordering a kind of bulk, I'm gonna, I hate to call somebody on blast about it, but I'll use for example, Jones reeds. Jones reeds are machine made, they're not handmade. So they're consistent in the way that they look, but they're not consistent in the way that they sound. You will not find a very clear breakdown of the reed parts on those, and that's why they're very inconsistent in the way that they play. So that's, one, that's kind of an evaluating factor. You can tell when it's a handmade reed because you can really very clearly identify all the parts of the reed when you see it through the light. Is that making sense so far? Do you have questions about that before I go on? I know reeds are really... Yes? How, about how long will a reed last if you're taking good care yeah. of it? Um, a month. Okay. I would say a month. The trick to that is that, well, if they're playing really extreme range of the instrument, maybe not, because wow. higher notes will wear it down faster. Middle school, easily a month or two. They need to dry it off before they put it away is part of it, too. Um, the longer they stay saturated and the longer they stay wet, the, the fewer amount of, they won't last. Yeah. But you could very easily get a, get a month or two out of a double read if it's a good quality and they're, and they're storing it away safely. And they're not smashing on their teeth every time they put it in their mouth, which they like to do the most. So <laughs> I had that happen to me in a recital one time, actually. Went straight and hit my tooth, and that was it. Had to walk off stage and change it. So <laughs> happens to all of us. Um, but yeah, so the quality and the, um, the, the style of the type of read that you're getting is really important to their, to their production. Uh, when we first start making a sound, the first thing I'm going to do with them is I'm actually going to take my lips all the way up to the string part of the reed, past where it is. This is going to be what we call a crow, right? It's kind of the first sound they make. It should always be a C, and it should always be an octaves. If you don't hear two notes 
or if one is louder than the other, that's going to directly affect that exact same range of the instrument. If you don't hear a high C, the, the high part of the reed is not functioning very well and they're gonna have a difficult time getting high notes out. If you don't hear a low C, same thing is gonna affect the low end of the instrument and they'll have trouble and difficulty getting low notes out. So I don't know that this one is balanced, but we'll hope that it is. So this reed only has a high C, which means if I were to put this on my instrument, I would be struggling to get the low vibrations out for the low end of the instrument, yeah? This is the easiest way to start and tell if your students are gonna be able to play in tune. They will never stand a chance of playing in tune if the reed isn't in tune before they start. So it should always be a C, put it up to a tuner, yeah? Most of the time with younger students, we start with really soft reeds because it's easy to get a sound, but I'll warn you that soft reeds also are going to be really flat. They will be flat. So I have for you the absolute best piece of advice I could ever give you as a double reed person ever. These are nail head trimmers. I bought them at Home Depot about 15 years ago. They're about $20. This is the easiest way for a non-reed knowing person to adjust these reeds. Yes? So you're going to want to squeeze it down so the blades are touching and you're literally going to nip the very, very teeny tiny end of the reed. I'm talking a millimeter at a time. Yes? But if they come in with a reed that's too soft and it's flat, I know it seems scary to adjust reeds. I know it does. <laughs> it's super scary. but. This, this will be the thing that will help you make them better faster without you having to constantly keep saying, kids, this reads out of tune, get a new read. Yeah, and it's a really cheap investment. You don't have to learn how to use a knife. You don't have to learn how to use all the other pieces and parts of it. I use this almost every single day, even for myself personally. Yeah, flat reads, clip them. Bassoons especially, they love to permanently flat. Yes, never make any adjustments to a read without the reed being soaked. Squeezing it, twisting it, moving it, clipping it, Anything. If you do it when the reed is not soaked all the way through, it will crack immediately, every single time. So make sure it's really thoroughly soaked before you make any adjustments. Okay, so after we've decided it's in tune, yes, we've had to maybe make an adjustment. The next thing you want to be really careful of is the opening of the reed. Okay, it should be a, this is going to sound vague, it should be a sort of flat football shape. Yeah, and the reeds, uh, the, the reeds should actually be offset from each other. So the reeds actually don't sit on the edges like this. They sit offset each other. So one reed will be kind of in the indention of the other one. If it's not, it's going to leak down the sides. And you're going to hear that air like hissing down the side, or they call it the spine, of the reed. So they do need to be offset from each other. And you can actually just sort of pinch and twist, and they will kind of like go back into line sometimes if they're not. If the blades are sitting directly on top of each edge of the next one, they're gonna leak air out of the side. So something else to keep an eye on. If the blades look really flat, yeah, that's also a pretty big issue. That means that the reed is kind of collapsed a little bit, but they should not be flat shaped either. It's like a kind of skinny, skinny football shape. Yep, curved and overlapped on the edges. Yep, bassoons as well. Um, they will leak out of the side if they're not, and I can actually give you trips to, tips to fix that as well if they are leaking, but that's not for today. So we wanna check the opening. Make sure it's not too closed, not too open. They normally are too open, normally. And so if you're going to make an adjustment to the opening of it, you want to grab, again, you're like, please don't make me touch the reeds. I'm so scared. I get it. You want to grab down below the heart, but right above the string, and you'll either very, very lightly kind of squeeze and wiggle, or on the edges, very lightly kind of squeeze and wiggle. Yeah, to open and or close. Again, if it's dry when you do it, you're gonna crack it pretty much immediately. So make sure the reeds are soaked, yeah? Um, if the reed is too closed, it'll be one of those things where they'll be pushing and pushing and they'll be blowing really hard and you'll see their face turn really red and nothing ever comes out, probably the reeds are too closed, yeah? Um, a lot of times they'll wanna try to play with the reeds closed because they can actually pinch and maneuver and make the pitch go up. Because as we know with the double reed players, we always start, they're usually really intelligent and they usually have a really good ear and can match pitch. But a lot of times they'll kind of self-sabotage by doing that because they know they can adjust it with their mouth. We don't want them to have to do that. 
They should not be making pitch adjustments with their embouchure in regards to getting it in tune or out of tune. They should be able to sit very naturally without any pressure on their lips and the reed should play in tune. So sometimes they'll, they'll squeeze it off their, themselves if it's a flat reed because then they can pinch it and get the pitch up really high. So just be careful. One of the tricks I used to like to do is make them put a whole lot of chapstick or lip gloss on because they cannot hold the reed in their mouth with pressure with chapstick and you'll see it slip right out. Yeah, they'll literally blow it out of their mouth. So something to try to make sure, put a whole lot like a whole lot of chapstick on them, be like, let's see. And then they should be able to sit that reed even with all their chapstick and lip gloss on and it still shouldn't wiggle. That's how the lightest amount of pressure they should have on there. Yeah. So something just to check. Um, so after I've checked the opening, maybe I've had to make an adjustment. Maybe I've had to scarily clip the tip of it and you're probably going to break three or four and it's going to be fine. I promise. Just buy some extras. I break them all the time. It's going to be okay. Um, we've checked the crow. We've made sure it's in tune. Then we're going to actually make a real sound on the reed. So as I mentioned before, the thickest part of the reed is about a third of the way down from the tip. It's called the heart. Yep. That's where we want the lip to sit on the, on the reed. Yeah. Um, the goal is to have even pressure on both of the blades. Now I, as I was telling him a second ago, I was actually a terrible fit for oboe because I have an overbite, but my dad was a band director and they don't care. And they're just going to make you play an oboe anyways, because that's what band directors kids do. So, um, good news though, if you see those kids when you're trying to select instruments and you can tell that in a couple of weeks, they're going to have braces put on, oboe and bassoon are actually pretty good picks. Yeah, because the lack of pressure and the lack of, um, of anything pressing on it or they don't have to bite down, it actually, they do pretty well with braces. It's not, as, um, it's not as much of a setback as it is for a lot of other instruments. So if you see those kids that maybe kind of you're like, oh, I don't know, I think you're going to end up with braces and maybe trumpet isn't, these are great picks because braces do not affect double reeds nearly as much as they do other instruments. So something to keep in mind. But we do want to have even pressure on both sides of the reed. So um, if there happens to be any kind of issue with the different sizes of the lips that create that from happening, maybe not a great selection for them, um, but just something to think about. That also sometimes changes the angle that they're going to have the reed in their mouth. Yeah, I have a much fuller top lip than I do bottom lip, so it actually ends up making me play with my instrument on a little bit farther of a down angle because I have to compensate some to equal my pressure. So there is sometimes some adjustment for that. I know we're taught a lot with the placement of the oboe to make sure that it's really far out from our body. But again, the goal is for that pressure to be even, and that may have to have some small adjustments depending on how the shape of the mouth works for them. Does that make sense? So. Do you guys have any questions about that before I go on? All the brass players are saying, thank God I don't play it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Me too. No. <laughs> um, so make sure the reed's in tune. Make sure it's not broken. Make sure it fits. Yeah. Um, these will always, always need cork grease. Always. Always. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. This is just a little metal tube, basically, and these pop out all the time if they're constantly pulling them without cork grease on it. So make sure they always have cork grease. I mean, this needs cork grease anyways, but the reed always needs cork grease every time they put it in the instrument. So just get them in the habit of doing that. Yes, bassoons don't, obviously, but um, they do need to be soaked really well so they can create. With bassoons, I don't know that I have one with me. I would also recommend that you invest in one of these. This is a reamer. Yeah, this is basically like some little blades and it goes inside the back end of it and it'll actually even it out and or open it up so you'll get a really snug fit on the vocal. That bassoon reed should always be really, really snug on the vocal. Like they should have to like really kind of work to pull it back off. If it's barely sitting on there and when they put their mouth on it, it's just sliding back and forth, it's too loose and probably need to make an adjustment. These are maybe $15 too. So of the few things I would invest in, clippers, and a reamer if you have bassoon students, yeah. And a harness for your bassoons, but that's a different conversation, yeah. Um, so yeah, so not a ton of reed. The common tendency is to take a whole lot of reed in. For this one, it's not too bad because I've already adjusted it, but too much into the reed, it's gonna sound really loud, really squawky, really, really abrasive. Too close to the tip of the reed, you're not gonna get a sound out at all. It's gonna close it off, it's gonna shut it down, nothing's gonna happen, yeah. So it's about that third of the way in. Um, assembling that part of it's not too tricky. So let me talk to you a little bit about the actual assembly of the oboe. Similar to clarinet, you're going to have these two bridge keys. They go down the back. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that they're really focusing on how those fit into the other. 
Also, and I know she'll talk about this on clarinet, you don't ever want to twist it completely around because then the keys are going to get stuck up underneath other keys. So um, I always tell my students to make sure they're grabbing on as much of the wooden part as they can. So a few of the fingers are touching as possible around the keys. And I just do little small sideways wiggles. Right, just a few little sideway wiggles just so you get it so they slide up underneath. When you're putting the bell on, if they have a low B and a low B flat key, which they should, you do have to press this key down to assemble the bottom of it because it will have to fit on top. So underneath each of those bridge keys, there's a little cork. And the first thing that happens when they don't is that cork will rub off and then it messes up the whole alignment of the bridge and then the keys don't lay flat and then you don't know why the key got bent. And then you're like, how'd this key get bent? And it's not because the key is bent, it's because the cork is missing and now they don't lay flat on the instrument. So just something to keep an eye on with that. Oh, I thought you were about to say something. Uh, so go ahead and take us through, do you recommend starting double reads as beginners? And do. if you don't, then where do you look for the switch mm -hmm. I do recommend starting double reads as beginners. Um, I don't think that there's a really, really positive correlation to another instrument with the exception of woodwind fingerings are all very similar. I just think that the challenge that there is mm -hmm. for those instruments just doesn't relate necessarily as closely to some of the mistresses we can. But if you are going to switch oboes, I would recommend flute players. I would not recommend clarinet players, ever, unless you absolutely have to. However, clarinet players do make good bassoon swaps, usually. Yeah? Um, I would recommend flute players if you're going to swap, because we have so many flute players to spare, right? That's something that we would swap. Um, trombone players make good bassoon swaps as well, if you have to. Um, a lot of those that have either a freer understanding of the pressure of their embouchure, a lot of those instruments transfer really well to double reed since we don't play with a lot of pressure. Um, that's something to kind of think about. When you have clarinets or saxophones that are used to having a lot of really strong contact with the reed, they sometimes don't do as well with double reeds because they put too much pressure on it and it kind of creates a big problem. So uh, I do recommend starting beginners. Uh, as I said, a lot of the pedagogy of teaching oboe in regards to instrument assembly, fingering, hand positions, all that's very similar to what you're going to deal with teaching your clarinets, teaching your saxophones. Um, the method books do a pretty good job with that. There's some fingering discrepancies with oboe, and that's a whole personal conversation. I did put that in the packet for you guys with the F conversation that everyone wants to ask me about, which F to use when. I gave you a hierarchy of Fs in the handout so you can know which one to use when. Um, but your oboists are always going to be soloists in your high school band. Always. They're always going to be soloists. If you're playing grade three, grade four, grade five literature, you're going to have an oboe solo. And so think about that when you're selecting those students. It's easy to pick very, um, very intelligent, very uh, maybe perhaps have had musical backgrounds, which is what I used to always pick. But sometimes those students are also very introverted. And introverted students don't always make good soloists. So think about that future for them. They will become your top ensemble soloist one day. And I think prolonged exposure to the instrument is important for that and making sure that that personality trait is considered when you select them as well. So. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome.